thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, it's great to be presenting. I always love presenting at Henley. I'm, I'm late to education, so I'm a student at Henley as well as I work at Henley uh, in the second half of my life, which is uh, a big adventure. Uh, and I love uh, I love learning here because uh, you meet people like Val, and uh, and it's uh, it's just a good place to learn, especially for a reprobate. So I'm going to share my screen, and then I'm going to get it onto the right screen, and then I'm going to start my slides. And so that's the first thing: is if you just guide people through a change, it's not as traumatic as everyone feels it needs to be. So uh, as I said, I'm going to talk about uh, presenting online. And, and these emojis I chose because I know when you are the focus of a conversation in any form, uh, for some reason, we've all been taught that being the center of attention is something we simultaneously dream about, but at the same time makes us feel completely nauseous and tortured, as if we're in some kind of medieval drama. Um, and it needn't be like that. And um, if you think about what presenting is, uh, it's simply a change in position in the room. You've been changed from being away from a focal point to a focal point. That's all it is. Deep down, we all want to be at the focal point, but somehow the thought of it terrifies us, much like me as a child dreaming of being famous, crippled by the thought of high performance and then uh, becoming a performer anyway. So it's quite strange. So my first thing is, um, it's not really the idea of presenting that you're afraid of. It's the idea of the idea you've been given of presenting. It's your own reaction to being in the front. When you are the focus of attention, remember that you're an animal that evolved on vast plains and you were afraid of predators. And the way you became aware of that predator imminently approaching you was becoming aware of the attention of the predator. Uh, and as humans, we are no longer chased by big dangerous animals. Um, we are hunted by the judgment of others. And this happens largely online and on social media. So that's the physical sensation you're getting when you move to the focal point you now become that uh, prey, and the predator has got its eyes upon you. Instead of wanting to eat you, it just wants to judge you, so it feels better about its average self. So remember that, because it's important as you shift, you, tra you transition from being hidden in the mass to being the center of attention and isolated. You are having a, um, a physical, um, a physiological reaction to being isolated from a group. So a little bit of separation anxiety. So um, it's not something you should... Um, see as a negative thing, because you're also being filled with the right chemicals to enhance performance. So you're getting a bit of adrenaline, you're getting a few other things in the brain, your heart rate's going up, you can think a little faster, um, and you can do things a bit more um, actively. So uh, try to remember that and understand why you're feeling that way, and that starts to rationalize it for you, and it turns anxiety into useful energy. Um, Peter Dick Ace famously said, he doesn't get nervous, he gets excited to meet the audience. I would encourage you to do the same. Don't panic. And um, just because your friend Dave at the bride said that, I hate public speaking. It's rewiring your brain to hate something which is irrational. It can't harm you to be at the front. So try not to act like you've been chosen for a firing squad because if you march up to the front of the room and your body language betrays you, or if you're on camera and you are hunched and nervous and, and very full of adrenaline in the wrong kind of way, we all do start to judge you because you're doing what we want you to do, which is crumble. So, and remember, we are the animals that invented gladiators in Roman times. We love that kind of dangerous, destructive uh, entertainment. So, so try and rationalize what's happening as you move towards the point of focus. It's really important. Okay, so I promised in my a trailer that I would speak on four main areas that can help you. So I, I've broken it really easily down. And this might be Henry's fault because I've become a student. So I like to organize my information in understandable cataloged uh, formats. So let's talk a little bit about styling. It's really important when you are presenting. Um, other than getting over your nerves, now there's some other tricks that I can maybe help you with. Um, here are some pictures of really unsuccessful um, people in Zoom calls. I know the Tiger King has become a sort of a meme of our time, um, but there's another example as well. Um, what this really means is, uh, Val did it beautifully tonight. I can see Val dressed up, did some makeup. She was kind of excited. And that's all part of styling. It's so important because it is an occasion to be in a frame and talking to other people. Um, you don't need them to kind of, um, you know, see you schlumping back into your sort of slippers and your everyday life. It's a little bit of a show. So try a little hard. Put some style in, a little bit of escapism. Um, we don't like the movie of our own lives. You would not pay to eat popcorn and drink a slush puppy if somebody played 90 minutes of your day without editing. 
And that's, that's why we like screens, because they're a window into another world. And we've been programmed as animals that are acquisitive. In other words, we always want more. That's how we succeeded. Um, is we, we want a better story. So try and be the better story for that person. I'm not suggesting you have to play up to modern uh, tropes, such as body shaming or any of those things. But be yourself, slightly enhanced. And that's what I always do in the show, always on stage, myself, just slightly enhanced. Because what you are, when you're at the, at the focal point, you are presenting a slightly enhanced version of the group. The group survives on maintaining an average. The individual stands out. So, so try and be outstanding. It, it's quite a good idea. Just a little effort. You, you know, behind the Lion King there, you could have straightened your background. Why well, have a like a, a schlumping background? It's just, it reminds you that sometimes life is just dreadful. Don't do that. If you are in the mood to shave, have a shave. If you're uh, in the mood to brush your hair, do that. Um, this man on the other side looks like he'd rather be doing anything else um, than swim through that sort of soup-like um, a lo-fi data situation than be at his screen. And he's got his t-shirt on, he's got his hand up. So what I'm saying is your energy matters. It makes a huge difference to how people perceive, perceive the presentation. And remember today, I'm not talking about every Zoom call. I'm talking about the Zoom calls where you would like a specific outcome. So when I teach, uh, when I do talks, uh, when I have important meetings or pitches, I observe all of these rules. It's just important because people watching someone who's tried a little harder, you'll, you'll see the attention go from to oh, and suddenly you'll perk up because it offers you something slightly better. So try and do that for the other person that you're presenting to all people. And that's important. Now I'm trying to figure out if my mask will change. Um, there we go. And um, there are tricks available over and above your own style. Um, so I would encourage you to use them. Uh, you can see that we use backgrounds um, quite a lot during Job Reset Fest. It's nice and it offers something else. It's different. You don't have to see into my life. You don't have to see my world, my mundane wall behind me, um, evidence that I am actually just like you. So, so um, play with backgrounds. They're there in your Zoom preferences. Just go to um, video backgrounds and effects. You can find them there, play around. Um, you don't have to have the world's greatest or whatever, but it's just, it's new information for people's brains. And the truth is that if you are staring at new information, new ways of information flying around your brain fire up and you form new pathways. More of your mind becomes available to what you're watching. So you're capable of greater appreciation. Here's one I found that's really handy um, on the screen. If you go to video and the setting and you find touch up my appearance, it flattens out your skin. And it's doing it right now for me because, uh, because if I have blotches or whatever, I want to be a little bit more kind of, ha ha. And uh, it's a bit of a show. So I use that trick and you should use it too. Why not? It's just some fun. And it's like a way of wearing base that doesn't come off onto your shirt and mess up your collar uh, throughout the day. I know it sounds like I'm playing up here, but we are in the middle of a global pandemic and people need to be cheered up. So you could say, well, it's my right to look crap. Well, yes, it is your right, absolutely. But that's not entertainment. Um, so there's a ring light. I looked at this particular model. It's 237 Rand and for that price, take a lot, we'll drop it at your front door. So if you have some important meetings come up, let's say four meetings, work it out per meeting, it's probably a good investment. So it's a good idea to get a ring light. And um, that way it doesn't shine the light directly on your face and make your kind of pores explode and you sweat and you shine. It gives you a gentle halo of even light that, uh, that makes somehow seem that you're part of this kind of more desirable world, uh, a bit of optimism for everyone. And then you'll notice uh, this evening, I'm standing. Um, you can do this with a couple of boxes and books. You don't have to go and buy an expensive standing table, but if you put your um, stuff up, your energy is so much better. When you're sitting and you slump and you've had a long day, we can see. I mean, we're having a bad day, but subconsciously, we don't know why. We don't know why we start to resonate with how you feel, but that's neuroscience. And it is true that if I'm standing, my energy is so much better, but also my blood flow. So my thoughts are probably a little more clear. So I suggest that if it's really important, get a couple of books, get a box, get a speaker. It doesn't matter, put a printer underneath, you can innovate your camera and you can stand. I also recommend that if you spend a lot of time at your desk every day, at least half your meeting should be standing. It's just better for you. And it's one of the number one killers of human beings. It's not moving. So I suggest that. So do use the tricks that are available. It doesn't always require massive investment or money. Just a bit of enthusiasm and uh, look around. Play with Zoom, play with Teams, play with all of those things. They all have little tricks and tools that can help you. The lighting is really important. So, so do those things. Use the background. 
you know, it's also nice to look into the screen and see yourself using kind of special effects. So those are just some of the tricks around styling, the way I look and present myself, affects my energy, which ultimately will affect the energy of the audience. The second place that I want to um, go is framing. And, uh, and that's really how you position yourself in relation to where the camera is. Um, we, we don't understand the importance of framing. It is so, so important. I see Janet in, in the audience bought a, a ring light for a hundred bucks and it works perfectly. And, uh, and the Porsche uses a shoe box. So well done, guys. You see, you're already doing it. It's brilliant. Uh, right, so framing. And you won't believe how a little bit of attention to framing can absolutely change the nature of your meeting. And I've been in some classes with international lecturers who got it wrong. And, and, and so it's a bit strange. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But there's a reason why framing is so important. And, and I love movies. A great film will make you understand the story better without any words and any clumsy exposition. Simply how the camera shows you the world, tells you so many details of the story. It's so important. And so um, the first one is if you underlit. It causes anxiety in human beings because we have facial recognition software in our brains. It gives us a sense of, uh, of um, um, reassurance when we have all the information we need about your face to form some kind of opinion. So a dark face is constantly asking you questions that your brain can't answer. It's distracting and it bothers you. And you may not realize that your brain is asking those things, but that's because you're processing about a billion thoughts a day. So we don't know the speed of our thoughts. We just feel the effect of their aggregate. So uh, it's quite important that you light yourself if you want the audience to be receptive. Secondly, the man in the middle. If you have a laptop, please don't angle it up. We don't want to see up your nose. It's the worst thing in the world. It doesn't matter how senior you are. It doesn't matter how clever you are. That man has a problem. And I don't know what it is, but I don't like him. I do not like the man in the middle. So, so humans don't like that because it's awkward. We've all been trained that whatever's up your nose is, belongs to you. It's your business and we have no part of that. For some reason, uh, things from your nose are uncool. So please don't show us that part of your world. It's not important to us. We don't want to know any of it. I have to sit through a lecture with a very, very good lecturer who was showing us her nose for several hours. And I don't think I understood one part of that subject. I had to go read it on my own. So please don't do that. Humans don't like socially awkward um, insights into your life. So that's important. And on, on the extreme, uh, I think it's on your left, um, we like our own lives. We're very self-involved. Uh, we really are. We don't really want to know your life because I know we're all very chummy and get along gang about things like, you know, your kids can arrive in the, in the meeting and that's all fine. I mean, I don't have a problem with if someone has a child or a pet, but you know, people who are slumping down food or, you know, they've just come back from gym and they've got a cap on and they, you know, just try a little, like, you know, like you, you were excited to come and give us some information or that other person, that friend that you can't see again, you don't know what he's doing, but it's obviously something to do with the terrorist group and you should probably contact the FBI. So try and remember that if you isolate yourself within the presentation, the focus is you and the information. And that's what's really important. And I'm really hoping that you will notice by now that you probably remember the things I've told you without having to take notes because of the way in which they're unfolding and the simplicity of, um, of the layout. So, so that's quite important. Um, and you need to, yes, yes. <laughs> I love the fact that, uh, that you like the man and his nose story, but that's great. So, so please, framing, very important. It's so simple and we love symmetry. There are apes that seek patterns. So we love to see symmetry and head is good. Um, you know, we don't need to see kind of your zip or any of that stuff. A good head and shoulders, nice clean background, probably a straight angle, straight on. I've styled myself, I've framed well, I've lit. So now, you know, I can pretty much get away with more than I might if you were staring directly at both barrels. I may not be able to give you the full um, benefit of my presentation if you're worried about my, my COVID test, so that's fine. Um, let's go on to the next one. So this is about your material. Now, this is something I, I, I constantly have to talk to corporate clients about because it's hard to watch someone wrestle the material. So you've all been taught, most of you, that if you don't put it into a corporate template, and I realize I am saying that while presenting to you in a template, but I do hope that our lead designer, Sienna's work here, um, will show you that all templates don't have to destroy your, your brain and, and drive you into a mine shaft of boredom. So, so yes, you need templates. 
but there are things about the way in which corporates ask you to share information that are mind numbing. And I don't mean that as a sort of a naughty, rebellious comedian. I mean that as someone who studied this. If your template is boring and mindless, you will generally switch off large parts of your brain as the presentation unfolds because you kind of know what's coming. You know, all you've got in the middle is the content. And unfortunately, many people present content like this. And not only do they put too many words on a slide, okay, but they, they don't really make it creative and conversational. It becomes too factual. Then they commit the worst crime on earth. They will say to a screen, in all seriousness, a brief history of speaker support material from 1928 to 2021. It was early in the 20th century that the relationship between blah, 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 you've gone to sleep. Many of you have read ahead of me. You've probably done to the bottom of the paragraph already. It's too many words. It's rubbish. It's not designed to light up your brain. This is how you read in a book. It's not how you read in a room or on a, on a Zoom call where um, you're not focused on the book. If you want to read, go and get a book. Don't, this is called speaker support material. It's not, it's not the speaker here to read you what you could perfectly read yourself. I think you can see in the fine print in the purple, there's a small critique of this slide. It genuinely sucks. It's rubbish. Um, if I would um, take this material and present it in the way that I would, it would probably look a little and um, like this. And the reason for this is not just that I'm like more comfortable with coloring in books than I am with books. I'm getting a master's. Um, the point is here that I want to switch on more of your brain. So the first thing is, I don't tell you what's going to happen next. So you have anticipation. And that's a very powerful thing for your brain. Lights up much more because you're a human and you mitigate risk all the time. So if you're unsure, you think harder. So that's quite good. So you do know that something happened between 1928 and 2020. And, and then we can think about what's coming next. It also keeps me on my toes as a speaker because I really need to know my material if I'm not gonna have the script to rely on. And I much prefer to do you the favor of knowing what I'm talking about before I present. Because if, uh, if you just have a senior leader who walks in, his PA has put together a presentation and I say he, because that's a largely kind of male corporate kind of a habit. Um, and then he's just gonna read it to you. It really, really um, is insulting to all of us. So what they discovered in around the, the let's call it the sort of th third of the way through the 20th, the 20th century, is that when groups of people were watching another person, if you simply started to design the way in which they visualize the information to support what they were saying, you got more engagement from people. That's basically what that last slide was saying. And the way I'm achieving that with absolute simplicity is I've observed a couple of rules here that you may not see, but I'll tell you what they are when you're designing the material. Number one, use one font. One font. I know that the word mark, job reset test, um, is a different font, but my fonts are all the same in this whole presentation. It's not clever to use more than one font. It's a very dumb design idea. So you can do it. It's very hipster, it's very cool. But if you want to portray information, one font. Minimal clutter. There is only so much what they call cognitive load that the human being can handle in one slide. So try to keep that as minimal as possible. Get Swedish is what I'm saying. Become completely minimalist. If you don't need it on the slide, throw it away. Tell the audience, okay? If you do it properly, they'll remember. If they don't, send in the slides. When they see the image, it will trigger the memory. So it's a really, a much more elastic way to use your brain in, uh, in sharing and taking in information. Use one icon style. You'll notice that all these icons are from the same family, and um, all of them, including that little arrow, all the arrows, they've got the black outline with the gaps. When you do that, you give the human brain uh, a pattern, and it loves a pattern. And so it's like a jungle gym. This is a good jungle gym. Now the brain can play. If the jungle gym is bad, like the previous slide, it can't even get up the first bar. It's really struggling. So use the same icons. It's a much cleaner, cleverer way to present things. Um, and this is a sneaky one. You will notice that what's called the Henry fabric is along the side of the slide. Okay, that's something which we are busy developing, which really talks about how diverse we are and how we fit together in a beautiful network. Something you'll learn more about in the future of, of Henry. But, but if you look very carefully, almost every color on the slide is selected from that um, palette. And the reason I did that is because I don't want to clash because your brain doesn't know it, but it doesn't like it when there's too much going on. So if you look very carefully, we've resonated the colors in the slide, almost everything comes from there. Use your color picker. It's such a great tool in that it doesn't matter if you use Keynote or PowerPoint, but be very clever in the way that you put your slides together. Part of the minimal clutter 
is how colors fit together. We don't admit it, but they're a huge part of our growing up identifying colors. Um, so, so do that as well. If you obey those basic rules, one font, minimal clutter, one icon style, and choose a palette and stick to it, you'll find that your slides will be more easily remembered. I know a lot of you are already thinking, wow, there's something about these slides. I know, I've, I've, there's a lot of tricks here to make your brain feel that way. So, so please do try and not to torture your coworkers with endless, no one cares how many words you wrote down. I know you worked hard, work smart, make it like this and explain it well. And that's what it's for. The slides are not your, your novel. They are your support as a speaker. Okay, so now I've delivery. I've got to check the time because I, I knew I would, uh, I would need most time for this. How about this for a slide? I'm going to try and tell you what I've learned in 25 years about delivery in one slide. Now, I wouldn't insult myself because it takes 25 years to learn what I've learned. Um, and, uh, you know, you wouldn't be very clever to think that I could give you all of that experience in one slide or in one day or in one year. But, um, but what I can do is I can give you a quick summary of, of what I've learned. So, so these are the things I've understood about standing in front of people. Number one, that heart icon. That speaks to the energy that gets raised when you're about to perform. Okay. Performance is a wonderful, um, a wonderful um, mode to be in. Often when I was doing comedy on stage, never felt more alive. Uh, because you, you switch on all your aerials, I used to call them, and, and you become totally um, in the world. Now, that's a result of a very beautiful com uh, chemical cocktail that, that, that uh, comes into your body when, when you realize you are going to be the hunter for a little while. And you can either become an enhanced version of yourself, or you can allow that energy to debilitate you. Most humans are taught that anxiety and stress are all evil. That's not true. And there's some good stress. It's called eustress as opposed to distress. And, and so eustress is what you use to run away from a lion uh, or to lift a car off your child uh, or to you know, jump over a, a burning building. Um, it's, it, it allows you to achieve extraordinary things. Um, it, it, distress uh, is bad stress. This is where it starts to become damaging to your system. So try and understand the difference. Understand an enhanced time. I was in a situation where I lived in a house for the first time in a very long time. I used to live in flats for decades. And I, I moved to a house recently. And what I found was one night I heard a noise and I'm unused to it because my flats have always been high up off the ground because I have trust issues. And, um, and I found myself forcing myself to go from being nervous that there might be someone in the house to suddenly feeling like I was able to see better in the dark and find this person and think about what I was going to do next. And it's incredible. If you can turn that energy from being debilitating to be enhancing, it's incredibly useful. It's not bad that your heart speeds up. You need to do something with it. You can survive your heart speeding up. In fact, you can run faster. So, um, so learn to recognize the modes of your fast beating heart. That makes sense. You can see it as a good thing or you can see it as a bad thing. It's not the heartbeat that changes. It's your attitude to it. So learn to ride the anxiety, ride the anxiety, the, 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 the nervous energy and convert that to hyper-awareness. It's a beautiful thing when you get to that stage of in the midst of this kind of uh, storm of energy, you just get this absolute clarity and that's quite important. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing I wanna say is the little Muay Thai fighter uh, in, in the middle. And so don't fight your material. It's really tough to watch someone fighting their way through the slides. Be prepared, be comfortable with who you are and be comfortable with the material. You have to do the work. You cannot just walk on unprepared. And um, you know, some people can wing it. But the truth is you've got to learn to dance with the material. You mustn't fight it. You really need to, uh, you, you really need to learn to kind of move with it. So, so learn that, become comfortable with the material. And, and often the trick is to set the tone for that dance is to walk up and say the first thing that's on your mind. It doesn't have to be a joke, especially if you're not funny. Don't do that. Don't start with a bad joke. It's the worst thing you can do because it puts the room in an extra awkward gear. Find something to talk about that shows everybody that you're connected to them. Talk about the venue, talk about something that happened just before you arrive on stage, talk about a big event that just happened in the world. Um, that's a connector. And what it does is it allows you to kind of relax into the material. Don't fight your material. It, it, it's the hardest thing for other people to watch. It's like watching a comedian die when no one's laughing. It is so difficult to watch. I, 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 I couldn't, I had to leave if, if it was happening, unless of course it was me. In which case, you probably should still be. Hey, good evening, thank you, and good night. I had a bad fire. Um, but don't fight your material. We, we don't want to watch you wrestle. Um, 
the next thing that I want to say is that ask questions all the time. Never, ever stop questioning your environment, question the material, question everything. Because I have this theory that um, intelligence is only about what you know about the moment, in the moment. So, and the only way you find out about the moment is to ask questions. So, so be curious, be eternally curious um, as a human being, even on stage, you can stop. You can ask someone a question. You know, it's not like you don't, you don't plug into your slide deck and then it's like a straight tube. You've got to get through it, break it, just slow it down, be nice and kind of, uh, you know, playful. And, and the way to be playful is you don't have to be offensive. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to force being funny. Just be curious. Uh, it's a great way to be. And it links to the heart because if you're curious, curiosity will suck that nervous energy and turn it into uh, using that hyper-awareness to find things to be curious about. So try and have an attitude of curiosity as often as possible. Uh, on the bottom row, um, that's feedback. And, uh, and this is back to the idea of being judged. Um, stop thinking about that. I know it's hard, but you have to learn to not care. I can honestly say for that about the last 10 years of being a comedian, I truly didn't care uh, about what the audience thought because I knew what I wanted to say. And, uh, and my comedy got better as a result. I know you have to play to the crowd, but so often, by worrying about um, feedback, what you are playing to is the lowest common denominator in that crowd. And I'm ashamed to say that I did that as a comedian for a very long time. I played to the lowest common denominator of the South African comedy public. And that's shameful. It's a crime. Um, you're better than that. And, and uh, we all are. And so what you should really do is not aim for the lowest common denominator, which you should try and do, is challenge the audience to reach for their highest common denominator. Challenge them, stretch them a little bit. And to do that, you need to forget about the feedback from the peanut gallery because none of them are doing what you're doing right now. So why, why, why does their opinion matter? You know, we live our lives with these anonymous people and judge us. And even if they don't, we think they might. So we adjust our behavior to the lowest common denominator. Don't do that. Be remarkable. Stand out. It's a little bit scary, but, uh, but you'll use that energy when you get scared to become hyper aware. So you'll be okay. And you'll know your material so you won't fight. And when that question comes up about, are oh, they judging me? You can go, I know I answer that question. I'm just curious as to why I answered that. I asked myself that question. So it's an interesting one. Forget about feedback. Really focus on what you're doing. Um, the feedback will come over a great deal of time. Uh, you don't need the feedback right now in the moment. You need, you need to build that over time. Be consistently good. Don't be a fluke artist in the next moment. So that's quite important. Um, Faith, I see your question. Uh, is it better to use visuals for slides than words? It largely depends on what you're presenting. You can use a combination of both. That would be my suggestion. If you want to present something highly technical, you, you may definitely need some words, but you can also use infographics really cleverly. So, so it really is a bit of a, a difference. Um, actually, I'm going to come back to you about the lowest common denominator. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Let me get through these and then I'll, I'll come to you. Okay, then there's the puzzle. Um, and uh, this, is the, this is the nugget. If I can just leave you with this and you get this, you will have a great time presenting. When you're presenting material, all you have to do is explain the material to yourself out loud. That's it. As long as you understand what you were saying about the material, it's like the pieces fall into place. That's all I have to do. I did not stand and say this talk over and over again. I read, them, I, I read what I wanted to say. I looked at the icons and then I put it aside. And all I'm doing tonight is I'm explaining what I had in mind when I designed this presentation to myself. It just happens that you are here. And if I do it like that, I take care of the icon before. Because if I'm so busy explaining it to myself, I'm not worried about the feedback. So can you see how these are all linked? So explain your material to yourself every time. You get the benefit of understanding it better. You get the, you get the benefit of seeing new things in your own thinking. You get the benefit of changing it if it doesn't work anymore. Maybe the world's changed and you've changed and you can change the material. But don't stand there on autopilot and just force this down people's throats. That's bad teaching and bad presenting. And then finally, this is another million dollar piece of advice that I was given a long time ago. Don't find yourself funny. Let everyone else find you funny. If that's your angle, if you want to go as the funny person, do not find yourself funny. It's one of the worst things to watch on earth is someone who finds himself hilarious. It lacks self-awareness. The greatest comics in the world don't tell the audience what to think. They allow the audience to find them funny. 
And it's a great thing in anybody with a sense of humor uh, who doesn't force it. They allow the audience to find them funny. So, so, so do that, because if you, if you try to be funny all the time, you are now looking at that other icon of feedback. You are looking for constant affirmation. What happens if it doesn't come? See, now you've thrown out your energy and you're not getting it back. So it's going to deplete your energy over the course of the presentation. You, not everybody has to be funny. It's not easy being funny. Sometimes it's, it's a result of a tortured life. <laughs> but, but that's for another book. Um, um, so don't do that. But, but allow the audience to make up their own mind. Uh, that's quite an important thing. So um, I, I see some questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to them at the end. I'm just going to check the time. Uh, okay, good. So that's that's those are those are the things I wanted to tell you. Now I want to get into the questions because I think that's quite an exciting place. So I don't know how you want to go on this spell. If you want to uh, read the questions, I'm happy to look at what's on the um, uh, to look at what's on the uh, on the chat. Uh, you can tell me. Um, firstly, thank you so much, John. That was quite helpful. We do have a question from Ashley. Um, I'm not sure if we've answered it yet regarding the lowest common denominator. Perfect. Great question. So Ashley. Ashley, sure, Ashley, that's a great question. And I'm so glad you asked it. Um, um, and I'm not just saying that because I would say that it, it's, it's the reason I gave up comedy after 25 years is because in South Africa, I grew up understanding that if I use stereotypes in my jokes, the audience would laugh. And particularly racial stereotypes, uh, because we are deeply, deeply stereotypical um, prejudiced bunch of people and I hope we evolve and I don't want to do it anymore so for example if we all make a joke and um, if I walk into a room and I say oh colored people have got no teeth and then everyone goes oh my god that's hilarious it's not hilarious it's a generalization about a group of people it's not true and um, it's just a horrific social uh, like thing designed to keep people and um, you know less than they are so that's what I mean is that we often play to that lowest kind of self we mustn't do that in South Africa. We really shouldn't do it. And it's not just about color. You can think of many, many, many of those things because we have structural problems in our country. And by structural, that means that we, they're so deep, we don't even know that they're there. So we are reinforcing something like stereotypical, institutional, structural, racial prejudice when we do jokes like that. Or when people insist that Indian people say, and all. And I grew up in Durban and, and I am, my very first friend in Standard 2 was, a, was an Indian guy, actually an alumni, and yeah, it's got an MBA, and, and, and A.D. Musa. And we, we kind of grew up through junior school together, and he never said an all once. And it, it, it just didn't, it's not an Indian thing. So, so that's what I'm saying, is that um, if you play to the lowest common denominator, and, and you know what things will get approval, Donald Trump is an excellent example on a macro scale. He played to the lowest common denominator, fear, division, hatred, um, you know, nationalism, and wall building. He knew that would be popular because it's easier. It's a path of least, uh, a less resistance um, and to, to appeal to people's lower selves. And I'm not suggesting that everyone is, is low or high. That would be binary and that's not true. But we do have a lower self and a higher self. And, and I think that they dance throughout your life. I would like to encourage people to be more comfortable with their higher self than their lower self. And so don't play to the lowest common denominator. Every time you present, you should try and help people to find the highest common denominator because surely that's that's social change. So that that's what I mean. I hope that answers the question. It did for me. Thanks so, so thanks so much, John. And that is a very important point. We tend to just look over these things, um, and it's a very very important question. Thank you so much, Ashley, for that question. We have a question from Cam Carmen. Um, how does these lessons apply when you apply uh, for a job and are being interviewed? Should you not read the room and be concerned about feedback? Another very important question there. Um, yes, so, so Carmen, it's, it's also a good question. I would have said to you, yes, you should read the room and you should react. But here's another angle to that. Let's say that you are not the person that they are looking for, okay? And then you read the room and you give them another version of yourself that doesn't exist because now what you're giving them is what they want, not what you are. How well do you think that job's gonna go? In the long run, how long, how long are you gonna be able to keep up that avatar that you've created on the fly for those people? So, so yes, you should be aware. Yes, you should, um, you know, if it's not going well, what I always do, if, you know, used to do if people weren't laughing the first thing i would do is say well this is not going well <laughs> you know just admit the truth and and, uh, and and try and see 
if you can pull the room back to who you really are and if they want your authentic self. Because if you're applying for a job that's going to involve your inauthentic self, it's going to become a struggle at some point, you know, unless you're planning a massive life change to become who you want them, who they want you to be. Same in a relationship, we do it all the time. We want to sort of get it together. We pretend to be what we aren't. And then generally long-term relationships are a process of negotiating back to what you really are, which is less than your kind of shiny self that you were on the first few days. So I'm all for trying to get to reality as quickly as possible. I know it's a tougher choice, but I think that playing to the room is going to make you a smaller version of yourself. And in the long run, I don't think that's cool. Yeah, but John, I think we have done all of the questions you've done well thank you so much for answering all of them um, you, famous Belle. last words for for louise just to shake it up before we leave um that's a good question there's a herman hess quote that i can't remember um exact the exact wording but i'll give you the gist i like the writer herman hess and um, i've read most of his books not the nazi there's another very nice german man who, who was nothing to do with nazis who wrote great books a long time ago and uh, basically he said that for people who are truly awake in, in their soul um, they don't need judges to tell them what to do. And I hope that we could all do that for ourselves and reach that highest common denominator so that we don't need the law to tell us that it's wrong to murder someone or steal from them or take what isn't theirs or let them die because we didn't keep the money for their um, masks or ventilators and we used it for our portions. So those would be my last words. Be better. It's easy. Thank you so much, John. And my last words is really thank you so much for joining us this evening. And what I've really taken away is that it's a shame to, to go into a situation or a meeting or a conversation and think that people are going to judge you even if they're not. Um, because we miss so much in the fear of being judged. Uh, we will catch you at our next Job Reset session. Please join them. They are practical. They are helpful. It was so good to spend the last hour with you. And we are going to close. Thank you. I have fun. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, see Thank you at the you next one. Bye. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye.